continue with our overview of the book of Revelation, coming to episode 4, chapters 15 and 19, in the month of April 2023. We're following a certain literary structure of the book based upon the Greek tragedy, verses 15, 5 through 19, 10, which correspond to about the last half of the three and a half years mentioned several times in the book. Here are my learning objectives. I hope that we can walk away from this place today able to describe seven end time systemic failures, otherwise known as divine judgments. Then to identify who, what, where is Babylon the Great. And then describe Babylon the Great's fall, collapse, failure whilst anticipating the joy that awaits us in the presence of Jesus. And then to relate biblical symbolism to natural reality. The book is full of symbolic language, most of it taken from the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament. But how does that relate to the reality of those living today or possibly a few years from now? Well, we'll start with a preview of where we're going today. We're going to see that the heavenly temple is opened and then shut, while seven angels are sent to earth with seven plagues, based on a divine accusation against murderous world powers. On earth, there will be a quake that demolishes cities, whilst the beast government is revived for that time, the great city Babylon will fall, well, and world leaders, especially the finance chiefs of the world, are going to mourn her collapse, whilst the righteous rejoice. Meanwhile, armies will gather for Armageddon. In any event, we start with a view of God's temple in heaven, opened for business. I looked, and the temple of the tent of witness in heaven was opened. Six and out of the temple came the seven angels with the seven plagues. No one could enter the temple until the seven plagues of the seven angels were ended. What do you observe of interest or curiosity? The heaven was open and seven angels came down with clouds. Yes, so they will come down from heaven. What is this tent of witness? Remember we said almost all the symbols in this book come from the Hebrew Bible. What was the tent of witness in the Old Testament? The Holy of the Holies. Well, it had a room called that. The tabernacle. The tabernacle. This is the place where Yahweh met with the priests of Israel. But now it's up in heaven. How did it get there? When the Lord instructed Moses to build the tabernacle, he said he was to model it after what? The one that was in heaven. The, the, right. What God showed him is in heaven. So this tent of tabernacle is not the old wilderness tent. This is the reality. Now, no one could enter the temple until the seven plagues were ended. What's that about? Why is the temple shut? Or at least access is denied. What if people were getting saved on earth and perishing? Could they go up to heaven? They'd have to wait. They would have to wait. We're also going to read that during this time, humans will not repent. And so it looks as though heaven's going to be shut for a while. I don't know if that's the reason. Why is heaven's temple open yet no one enters? Well, you know, normally it's a very busy place. Angels and souls and are coming and going all the time. And the preachers, the 24 elders. Here's something easy. What is, this, what is significant about the number seven as used in the Bible? Creation. What about, okay, creation occurred during seven days. So starting because God created the animals and the earth in seven days. Yes, yeah, That's, that was part of it. But there are many occurrences of seven in the Hebrew Bible, especially, and even in pagan literature written at the same time. It was the number that indicated that I'm giving you the entire list or the whole package. And so the seven plagues are going to be everything that God has in store for a world that has rejected him. 
Now, in the Bible, what causes some plagues? Think of other plagues. What was the, what was their origin? Sin. That, may, that was the cause. Let's talk about who sends the plagues. God of the angels. Well, this is a Sunday school question. Everybody should know the answer. <laughs> it was when Yahweh sent the plagues against Egypt, we know that those plagues were all against the gods of Egypt. And the last one, the death of the firstborn, was against another god in Egypt who was Pharaoh himself, who was believed to be divine. And it was Pharaoh's responsibility to ensure that the sun rose every morning and that the Nile continued to flow. Right? What is the divine purpose then of plagues? What do they seek to accomplish besides destroy things? Wake people up. Wake people up. Repentance. Seeking repentance. Maybe showing divine displeasure. Uh, gets their attention. Gets their attention. But there's going to be something else I hope will become clear in a moment. Let's get into them. Here's the first plague. Painful sores. The first angel went and poured his bowl on the earth, and a foul and painful sore came on those who had the brand of the beast and who worshipped its image. So was God just indiscriminately hitting everybody with sores? No. No, notice the object of these sores. Those who had taken the brand of the beast or the mark of the beast. Why was that significant? Those who chose to ignore Jesus. They had chosen to ignore Jesus and they had given their allegiance to... Satan. Right. What they know to be satanic powers. Idol worship. Yeah, they included this idol worship. They worshiped even the image. Even two or three decades ago, we could not imagine what the image would be like so that everybody in the world could see it. Now we know how everybody in the world could see the image. I'm working with a Bible translation organization right now, producing scripture portions for oral communities who don't read or have a Bible. But they all have what? A phone. A phone, a smartphone. <laughs> and they can all see the image. And so our Bible portions come, of course, with uh, pictures. Now, this is going to be in despite of vaccines and medications, as some governments currently are pushing for obligatory vaccination of entire populations, it's not going to be able to prevent these end-time diseases. So usually, uh, such sores are a sign of malnutrition or of infection, rather than a lack of a vaccine. Who else in scripture suffered painful sores? Job. Job did. Was he an unrighteous man? No. No, but he, but he was being afflicted by whom? By Satan. By Satan, but with whose permission? God. 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 But more to the point, which enemies of Yahweh suffered sores? Unbelievable. Well, which ones? I mean, in particular, I'm thinking of Abram when he asked his wife, Sarai, to pretend to be his sister, which in fact she was. It was a cousin marriage, to deny that she'd be uh, Abram's wife. And of course, he, she was taken into Pharaoh's harem, and of course, kept separate for a whole year to be sure she wasn't pregnant. And meanwhile, Pharaoh and his household began suffering yes. some terrible sore. And in the context, you can imagine what kind. All right, there's a second plague, when sea life dies. The second angel poured his bowl into the sea, and it became like the blood of a corpse, and every living thing in the sea died. Um, now, I did used to work in a mortuary, but I cannot tell you what's so unique about the blood of a corpse, other than it doesn't flow. All right, everything in the sea died. Why would this be especially terrible? Food source. Right. You're right, Dwayne. It's a food source. This is going to happen despite UN-sponsored Oceanic regulations. <laughs> <laughs> In fact, these, uh, these governments believe that they're going to save the seas 
by limiting your and my access to them. But it is a major source of food for coastal populations and with today's uh, transport technology for entire countries. Think Japan. Yes. It, is it clear in the scripture as to whether this is a sea or if it's all the waters of the oceans? Well, grammatically, it's a singular. So it's either a generic, all seas, otherwise, which sea would it be? Mediterranean Sea. Mediterranean, possibly, because it feeds that region of the world. If you limit it down to the Holy Land, it would be which one? Yes, which was famous for its abundant fish life. However, what else does the sea symbolize in Scripture? See, this term of the sea here could possibly evoke the symbols of the Hebrew Bible. Can you recall any of them? For example, Isaiah wrote, In that day the Lord will punish Leviathan. He will kill the dragon that is in the sea. Leviathan? The dragon? Is that kind of language found in the Bible? Aren't those ancient myths, fairy tales of some kind? Well, yes, they were. However, the Bible borrows the mythology of the pagan world and makes of them symbols of spiritual realities. Satan, the fallen angels, the dominions and principalities that rule over cities and countries to this day. But in the end time, he's going to kill Leviathan, that great dragon, who is well known, by the way, in uh, ancient literature. So. When I was studying Ugaritic language, transcribing cuneiform from tablets, and then into letters, and then into a language very similar to Hebrew, the prophet said, now look at this text over here, and we learned about Leviathan, whose name was pronounced in Ugaric, Lautan. So in any event, in the book of Revelation, yes, it is describing reality as it will happen, but with a very important spiritual message. Third play, water pollution. The third angel poured his bowl into the rivers and the springs of water, and they became blood. Blood is a symbol of what? Life. Life, but more you in this text, it's not life, what is it? Death. Death. It's death. The blood is a symbol. So we, when the book scripture says that if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of his son Jesus cleanses us from all sin. What's the point there, blood? Is it the liquid that flowed down his side onto the ground when he was pierced with the spear? His death. It's his death, yes. He died on behalf of all of us and then rose again so that we live both by his death and his resurrection. Now, this is going to happen despite the best government and industrial care regulations and the shutting down of industries throughout the Western countries in order to save the planet, right? Well, especially the water sources. However, you know, how many train crashes does this country average per year? Have you heard? It's thousands, isn't it? It's about 1,700. So when you read in the news that a, a major train crash has happened every two, three, four days, they're only reporting a few of them. And those are usually the ones that spill their cargo into water streams. But this is going to be much worse. So say the obvious, clean water is required for life, health, and sanitation. For four years, I worked with a European organization in various uh, neglected regions of Africa where there was little or no clean water. And I have visited communities and chatted with the local people about their health only to find most people are sick most of the time. Most of the children would die within a few months. Few survive age five. And so what did we work with them on? Getting your water clean. How to keep it clean. How to use clean water. How to ensure that the children don't drop cow turds into the clean water to watch them float. You know, you've got many things you have to do. <laughs> but then of course, at the same time, you introduce training in sanitation and nutrition. 
Yes. Yes. yes, that's very true. In Africa, in part of some countries, it's very difficult to get good water. Um, you're very correct that uh, age zero to five, a lot of children die because of malnutrition or any other sickness from the water. Yes. So we we have that challenge in yes. most countries in Africa. And not Africa alone. I've been to various parts of, uh, of the South Asia as well. Very similar problems. So when I travel in those parts of the world, I always carried with me a portable water filter. <laughs> and I would run my drinking water through that. Even so, I, mean, I would get sick once in a while. So much so that I'm pretty much immune. <laughs> yeah. How to obtain clean water where there is none? What would you do? You can boil your water. You can boil it if you have fuel yeah. and a pot. <laughs> um, yes? Well, filter like you just said. In fact, Jennifer and I, we used filtered water for decades living overseas to the point where we still do. And here's my system. In my country, some parts in my country, they used to get the water at the distance of five miles. Yes. So when they got in, they bring it home, they have to boil it. Yes. That's why it's for, for the family to consume. Yes. yes. They want to take shower with it's different from the one That's in right. the yeah. boil. Yeah. So uh, we run a special uh, research project into northern Cameroon, and we were put in a house that had neither electricity nor running water. So we, uh, but we know what to do. We had two steel drums, big steel drums, outside in the front corners of the house. And when it rained torrentially in the summer, those barrels would fill with water in minutes. Yes. And we used that for everything, washing clothes. Yes, that's not our best water for us. We, we, we used to have best water when it's raining. Yeah. Okay, in any event, you can build a food safe, drip fed, home water filter for under 40 US dollars. And it only takes about half an hour. And the, 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 the ones that you see right there, we made ourselves. They're now 12 years old. They're still filtering water wonderfully, which we use for drinking and cooking. We use the municipal water supply for bobbing and laundry. There's a, quite a few groups that are going to Africa at that one place anyway. And they grow wells. Where there's places there's mm -hmm. water available. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the, the company I worked with, that was their main industry, was well drilling. Mm -hmm. But after drilling wells for several years, they found that they were not improving the health situation mm -hmm. in the communities that now had the new wells because they knew nothing about heat. Um, oh, there's another trick. If you have what is probably contaminated water, but you can find some clear plastic bottles, which are rather pervasive around the world currently, and run that, put that water into these bottles. Put it through a piece of cloth to get the big particles out if you can, and then leave the bottles lying under the bright sunlight all day long. That will kill 99% of the pathogens and make the water potable, drinkable. Are you saying that when this happens, so here's these, all these water sources are now flood, you really, it would still work to boil them and clean them? If you know how. But the uh, point is, uh, now, much of the population is going to survive this, and uh, they'll have their ways to do so, just as the Egyptians did when the Nile turned to blood. Now, why would God do this to entire populations, the entire Middle East, if not the whole world? The scripture gives us the reply. You are just, O Holy One, who are and were, for you have judged these things. Because they shed the blood of saints and prophets, you have given them blood to drink. It is what they deserve. I look at that last phrase there. It is what they deserve. It is, uh, uh, in our theology, from scripture, in the life of Jesus, God is merciful. So he forgives the repentant on the basis of the shed blood of Jesus. And he wants to. This is his first choice for everyone. Sure. However, he is also holy. And so he must judge outrageous evil. Now, 1 John's epistle, John's first epistle says, there are sins that lead to death. He also said there are sins that do not lead to death. You have to 
God can distinguish those pretty well, and he asks us to try, and to know why some tragedies happen. But here's the point. God never inflicts humans with more than they deserve, neither in this life nor in the afterlife. No one will suffer more than what they deserve. Eternal life, of course, being a free gift of God. Well, fourth play, solar heat. The fourth angel poured his bowl on the sun, and it was allowed to scorch people with fire. They were scorched by the fierce heat, but they cursed the name of God who had authority over these plagues, and they did not repent and give him glory. Now this is sad. I mean, nobody's happy over what's going to happen to a godless population. Uh, and if you've lived in a very hot country, or been caught out in a desert place under the sun, no shade, maybe little or no water, it's, it's miserable. Yes. That's the reason why God was taking the children of Israel to the promised land. In the night, He gave them light. Daytime, He gave them cloud. Yeah. So that they will not suffer from the morning sun. Doing evangelistic work in some very harsh climates, uh, our teams learn to pray to control the weather. You can pray and stop the rain. You can pray for cloud coverage. God doesn't always do it, but He often seems to. Can I ask a question? Yes. Well, there it says that these people curse the name of God. So are they truly attributing what is happening to God? Uh, apparently, all right, what percentage of the world is atheist? Something less than one. Some countries it gets up to 7, 8, 10, 15 percent. But that's a philosophy that is taught in schools. It isn't what the folk really believe. They don't know, they do not experientially know or have a relation with true God, but they do have a name for God. And that differs in um, most language groups. So working um, amongst uh, some East African, uh, especially up in Ethiopia, his name was Waka. You had to know the word. What is, what is the usual word for God in uh, Kikuyu? Gai. Gai. We imende go. 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 Yes. Okay. Right. Any other languages you know? Mungu. Mungu. That's why he... Yes. Kuru. In Wolof, we, we call him Yalda. It sounds like Allah, but when the Muslims came in and imposed Islam and said you must worship Allah, local folk thought they were saying Yalda, which is the sand lizard. And the sand lizard is a totem for some clans. And to this day, we say Yahweh. Yahweh. All right. Okay. Yahweh in Hebrew, if not Yahweh. All right. Despite this is going to happen, despite engineering, geoengineering. Do you know that term? Engineering of the earth. That, okay, that's the etymology. Geoengineering is the attempt to control the climate by darkening the sun. And how do you darken the sun? Cloudy clouds. <laughs> Drive more gas cars. Yes, that would work. Sorry? Drive more gas cars. Like <laughs> <laughs> putting up a shelter. A shelter? Okay. Um, I don't know how much of it is true uh, or verifiable, but there are many testimonials online of even government workers and Air Force pilots and so forth who say that they, they spray the atmosphere with chemicals and particulate matter in order to create a kind of thin cloud to decrease the temperature of the earth. Not because we need it, but because it's part of the climate control industry to avoid saying hoax. All right, most climate change, of course, may result from solar activity over which you and I have how much control? Zero. Zero. <laughs> Zero. But, I'm sure, but I'm sure, I mean, even though they're cursing God, yeah. um, I mean, people curse God all the time, you know, but they also blame people for polluting the earth and causing all this, so people are getting the blame for it. We currently, people are getting the blame for it. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering, with sufficient international regulation and laws, perhaps even suppression of all privately owned fossil fuel 
God is going to say, you think you're in control of the world and you've denied me? I'm going to show you how much control you have. I've always thought that um, with all the technology and everything that's happened and with you know all the business of global warming and all that, that yes, people will curse God because that's what they're used to doing, but it doesn't mean they really mean that there is one God and he's in charge of these things that are happening. They'll all be explained by different technology kinds of things. Like geoengineering didn't work. So, you know, they curse God for it, but but it's not the hand of God doing it. It's the geoengineering. According to that belief. Right. Of course, we know it is. God right. Right. But people that don't know God... My guess is that the majority of the population of the world would attribute this to an intervention of God or the gods. What happens when you do plants, when you increase the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere? This is well-known plant biology. Now, the leaves of every living plant, or most, at least the ones, most of them, are peppered with little openings called stomata and the uh, the stomata can open or shut according to the need of the plant to take in carbon dioxide from the atmosphere but when they open up to get the uh, carbon dioxide they also release the water that they have drawn up through their roots through the stems out into the leaves and that represents huge water loss to the plant but if you increase the carbon dioxide the stomata is shut, and they no longer lose their water. The carbon dioxide not only causes the plants to go faster and healthier and produce more food for the world, but it saves on water at the same time, conserves the water source. So what, oh, this is a question. I didn't know this, but I looked it up. What percentage of our atmosphere is actually carbon dioxide? Three or four percent or five percent, it's not very much. It's not very much. Uh, so I went to more than one site and they, they all tended to agree, which means they, they have had the same source. It's about 0.04 percent of the atmosphere. And if you could, uh, it's gone up in the past century from 0.03 percent. So something has caused it to go up. Is it enough to kill life on Earth or to clog up the atmosphere? If it does, it's a very, very tiny percent of what's happening in uh, atmospheric change. Uh, or if you increase that to 0 0.05, food production can almost double. So we need a little more carbon-based pollution in our atmosphere to feed the world population, <laughs> the growth of which is scientifically shown to be so slowing so much that within 30 years, there will be no more world population growth. Fifth plague, darkness on the beast. Ooh. The fifth angel poured his bowl on the throne of the beast, and its kingdom was plunged into darkness. People gnawed their tongues in agony and cursed the God of heaven because of their pains and sores, and they did not repent of their deeds. We're dealing with a, a population that has uh, pretty deep into its bondage to the evil one. But notice where this happens. Is it the whole world? No. No? That's, well, I, apparently not. But how far does the beast's kingdom go? Uh, if it's regional, it's regional darkness. If it's global, it's global darkness. This is going to happen despite our switch to green power. I don't know how we will ever make that happen. So cities that are near very windy regions like Chicago could probably power itself from wind turbines, but most of the rest of the world could never. All right, painful sores continue. Ooh, no healing yet. And what does okay? What does it mean to repent? To change. Uh, re yeah. what, what about feeling badly for what we did? I'm so sorry I did that. Is that repentance? Nope. It's not repentance until you stop doing it change and uh, turn your life around and how could we possibly ever make a radical change to our faith and behavior 
Not by ourselves. Not by ourselves. It might need some help from somebody who knows how to do that, has the power to do it. But again, our Lord and Savior told us that if your brother bug you or do something contrary to your feelings seven times, you have to forgive him seven times. Yes, yeah, that's, that's true. That's that doesn't thinking. mean that he has repented. He keeps sinning against us, but we are not to hold a grudge. We're not to take vengeance. And this is a that verse has been a huge encouragement to me over the years. Yes, quite honestly, nobody will bug you seventy times, seventy three. He or she cannot acknowledge that right. he is doing something wrong to you. All right, okay. he will stop. So instead of repenting or apologizing to you, if I am required to forgive you mm -hmm. seventy times, seven times, how often will God forgive me for the same offense? Yeah. Sixth play, demonic spirits. The sixth angel poured his bowl on the great river Euphrates, and its water was dried up. Demonic spirits assembled the kings at the place that in Hebrew is called Harmageddon. River, what's important in scripture about the river Euphrates? Well, those demonic spirits are the fallen spirits that fall from the heavenly kingdom, who are now trying to rule this world. They are the gods that they become and pour their spirit on some people who do not acknowledge Jesus as Son of God. And they we pour down their they are whatever they want to do to humans who belong to them. Mm -hmm. And in this case, we didn't read that part, but the pit will be opened and many spirits, evil spirits, will come out of the pit and will spread through the world, including these demonic spirits that assemble kings at the place called Armageddon. It's interesting to research those spirits that are going to come up out of the pit. Who are they and how did they get there? That's not so clear in the Bible, and so the Jewish writers of antiquity, they, they figured it out. <laughs> they have their explanations. Uh, some of them decided that those are the souls of the sons of God who had come down and corrupted the earth before the flood, and have now been consigned to sometimes called Hades or Tartarus. Bible trivia. Right. This is going to happen despite conservation engineering, our best efforts. By the way, the Euphrates River, have you been following the news about it? Dried up. It's virtually dried up. In fact, along the river, there, the archaeologists are now finding towns and ancient cities that were buried by the river centuries or millennia ago. Mm -hmm. And so if you're looking for a dried up Euphrates, there it is. Now, that's not necessarily what this verse is predicting. Now, they're going to gather for a great battle to happen at a place called Armageddon. But that's not going to happen until the next episode. They'll gather in the current episode, their battle will occur somewhat later. Uh, so, shall we just go on? Are there any questions about this verse? So, where is Armageddon? Oh, okay. <laughs> By the way, we didn't read the verse that said 200 million combatants will come across the river. Again, because of the way symbology is used in the Bible, we don't know if 200 million just is a symbol for a countless number of soldiers or whether there will be that many men and women with their equipment, uniforms, and weapons. In any event, are there enough Muslims? Yes, there are plenty. In 2019, there were nearly 300 million Muslims just in the Middle Eastern countries alone. And if you put half of those under arms and some contingents from Iran and China, you can do it. All right, where is Armageddon? Literally, the word, all right, the text that we just looked at said this is a Hebrew word, it's not a Greek word, but it's transcribed into Greek because the New Testament written in Greek. But in Hebrew, the term means Mount of Assembly. It comes from, it actually occurs in Hebrew in this verse. You said to yourself, I will ascend to heaven. I will raise my throne above the stars of God. I will sit on the Mount of Assembly on the heights of Zaphon. I will ascend to the tops of the clouds. I will make myself like the Most High. So, this phrase, Armageddon, is borrowed from this verse in Hebrew. 
by the who is speaking in this verse? You said to yourself, who was that? Who said this? God said this to Isaiah. All right. Um, this is someone who says he's he wants to become as the Most High, but he is not the Most High. No, he's not God. Antichrist. Uh, possibly be fulfilled by Antichrist. Mm -hmm. yeah, that, that, that's the most probable candidate in my mind. But that idea of Antichrist won't be revealed until some centuries later. Uh, the text was addressed to the king of Babylon. But what is said here is borrowed from pagan mythology, from Babylonian mythology. And so we understand that when Isaiah is talking through the king of Babylon to Satan himself, who is the one seeking to become like the Most High. But we have some phrases to deal with here. I will ascend to heaven. Uh, okay. Uh, but is that the heaven, the spiritual heaven of God, or is that the heaven where the stars reside? Oh, by the way, stars in the, new, in the Hebrew Bible. Sometimes it refers to just the twinkling things that we see in the night sky outside of Oregon. <laughs> uh, but just as often it refers to spirit beings, divine creatures or angels that move around in the heavenly place. And so the term stars was used of various spirit beings. Some folk may have actually believed that the luminaries were living things. Uh, I will sit on the Mount of Assembly on the heights of Zaphon. Do you know where Zaphon? It has nothing to do with musical instruments. The word literally in Hebrew and other Semitic languages means north. So on the heights of the north, but it was the name of a mountain peak in the Bashan range of mountains, which today are called the Golan Heights. And it was believed by the ancients, both Hebrews and pagans, to be an assembly place for the gods. They could dwell up there, or humans could not dwell because of the cold and the, and the uh, altitude, and the thin air, and the lack of food or fodder for, for herds. So they figured, oh, it must be the gods who meet up there. <clears throat> and in other verses, it's Yahweh himself who says, that he and his anointed one will rule from the north, which shifts then in scripture to Mount Zion, which is synonymous to Jerusalem. And so this apparently has nothing to do with the, the plains called Megiddo. Now there are some plains called Megiddo, and possibly invading armies will camp there because it is flat, and has good roads and a food source. Uh, if you're interested in linguistics, this is in Hebrew, the term har is, means mountain, hill, high place, and mohed <clears throat> uh, is something like assembly or anything that you can count and put into a heap, but it is where folk can gather as well in great numbers. And so uh, that little backward query mark, that's the letter, Semitic letter, anin, which does not exist in most European languages, or even most African languages. So when they wrote out this word, Harmoched in Greek, they didn't have a letter for Chayin. So they used the closest letter, which was alphabetic gamma, and which we transcribed as a G, and so it sounds like Harmageddon. And the O-N at the end, that's just a requirement of Greek, to make it sound like a Greek word. So my conclusion, what we have here is a set of ciphers. Ciphers are terms that have to be decoded. And once decoded, Zaphon refers to the, which means north, becomes Mount Zion. In, uh, and so <clears throat> from Hedon is the city of Jerusalem. If this interpretation uh, should indeed prove accurate. That's my. That's always my exit point. I may be wrong. Seventh angel. The seventh angel poured his bowl into the air, and there came flashes of lightning, rumblings, peals of thunder, and a violent earthquake. The great city was split into three parts, 
and the cities of the nations fell. They cursed God for the plague of the hail. This is going to happen despite sound building codes. And as we know in most parts of the world, most governments have very sound, good building codes in place. <laughs> now, if only, if only the builders could abide by them. So folk, folk become homeless, foodless. Uh, Ezekiel had predicted on that day, it is in the day of the Lord, which this text is dealing with, there shall be a great shaking in the land, the land of Israel. So Israel will not be exempt because it will be invaded by possibly more than a million foreign troops. Kings will wage war on the land. The ten kings who have not yet received a kingdom are united in yielding their power and authority to the beast. They will wage war on the Lamb, and the Lamb will conquer them, for he is Lord of lords and King of kings, and those with him are called and chosen and faithful. Now, the two major interpretations of the ten kings. Some say those are ten Roman emperors, and try to make this all fulfilled, of course, in uh, ancient history. The other major interpretation is that these are the ten countries, nations, that are named in the Hebrew Bible as the end time enemies of Israel. So if you go to the site, Galen Kura Doc Online, uh, I put up there a short video that identifies those 10 nations as they existed in antiquity and where they are today and what today they're called. And so some say this, these are the 10 kings of the end time nations that God knew about three millennia ago. So, this beast, world, world or regional government, that crucified the Messiah once, will not hesitate to wage war on him again. But, here's something surprising. The beast and the kings will destroy the woman. Well, the they and the beast will hate the whore. They will make her desolate and naked. They will devour her flesh and burn her up with fire. The woman you saw is the great city that rules over the kings of the earth. And it goes on to say, and by business with her, they, the super wealthy became fabulously rich. And so we're dealing here possibly with the financial system, the great international banking systems and cartels that determine where wealth flows all over the world, who has access to it, and who has to pay the bills? We won't have time to discuss the Federal Reserve this morning. The beast system itself and the kings of these nations, they hate the world financial controllers and they're going to destroy that system. The first beast we read about was Satan ruling over the world from out of the sea, that is that place of chaos and satanic opposition. Second beast we identified as a globalist leader probably equivalent to Antichrist. Then we have the ten kings who are national leaders yet to be empowered. The text makes it clear that most of them do not yet hold that authority. It means there's going to be some nationalistic movements in the end. And then the woman represents the city or networks of cities that controls international finance and trade. Now, is there such a network? Could you name it? We don't have to. The world has already named it. There are numerous sites that have identified for us. Uh, this list was of seven goes on. It's actually 20. And just to focus in for a moment on the financial system, the main controllers of the world's flow of capital and of debt happens to be seated in New York. And secondly, it has to be the city of London, right? Uh, oh, Shanghai, followed by Beijing. I have to know the accents. Oh, there's London, finally. And not the London that people live in. This is the city of London, which is an independent country. Uh, <laughs> I was surprised. Luxembourg is. And then back to China, Hong Kong, and Shenzhen. I've been to Shenzhen. Nice place. Every morning, folk go out and sweep the sidewalks. <laughs> Maybe that's something our church could do. Go out and clean the sidewalk. All right, two minutes left. The beast and the kings will destroy this woman 
and then an angel will come out of the heavens crying. Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great, for all the nations have fallen from the wine of the wrath. The kings of the earth and the merchants of the earth have grown rich from the power of her luxury. And so this is Babylon the Great, personified as an immoral woman, which seems to be the entire satanic world system of governance, finance, exploitation, religion, persecution, and immorality. Meanwhile, there's a message here for Christians in every century. All Christians reading the book of Revelation have been set, told, Come out of her, my people, so that you do not take part in her sins, and so that you do not share in her plagues. In other words, don't get caught up in the world system and miss the resurrection. Rejoice over her, O heaven, you saints and apostles and prophets, for God has condemned her condemnation of you. So how do we come out of the world system? One minute left, what are your ideas? How can we come out of the system and yet have to work in it? We have to be more particularly low. Now, I can circle or it to start with. Here are my last, my closing ideas. Let's lead a holy life. Let's earn a living. Let's treat others justly. Stay faithful to Jesus, to your spouse, to the promises you've made. Worship God, rear children, if He gives you any, and love others.